Welcome everyone to the second Public Interest Technology Colloquium. Stories and ideas we love are always based on truth. My name is Katina Michael. I'm a professor and director of Society Policy Engineering Collective. And today our special guest is Miss Susie Josie Featherston from New Zealand. Welcome Susie. Morena, good morning everybody. Um, very early morning here for me, so it's a little dark and you'll see the sun come up. We're the lucky ones in the world to see the first rays of the sun. So thank you so much for being here today with me. Um, I'm living here in New Zealand. Uh, and um, I'm a storyteller. And that in those in that way, I tell stories about people on film. I use the medium of filmmaking and documentary. And I also um, I have another hat where I uh, write for directors. I write treatments for directors. And those are, are film directors who are perhaps working mostly in commercials. This is my day job, mostly in commercials. And I will explain to you in a little while what that treatment is. It's, it's a technical document. So my passion is to really tell stories that are not about truth, not so much an issue-driven journalistic style of truth, but about human stories told in a heartfelt, experiential way. I tend to eke myself out of uh, the it all documentaries. You don't see me, you don't hear me. I use people's own voices where possible. Interestingly, the one issue-driven more issue driven uh, documentary I ever made is where I met Katina. But um, mostly they're, they're what I would call human portraits. So that's that's my love. That's where I started. And um, just to give you a little bit of context as to how I became a filmmaker in that way and also a writer of, of director's treatments, I uh, was in the UK and I was based in advertising. I was a creative in advertising. And uh, I worked on, you know, big brands and advertising agencies, and I loved it. Uh, what I loved about it was always, as a, as a creative in advertising, you're like uh, a person that's distilling a product down to its absolute truth. So I absolutely enjoyed that process of what was different about this pen, you know, and what was its unique properties. Now. Um, of course, in reality, and I found out over the years that quite often the truth wasn't what the client wanted. So eventually I did I did sort of leave that creative role in agencies. But during that time, I was very fortunate to have a very dear friend who was a, a producer director her, for Access Hollywood and Entertainment Tonight, two shows that are in America you may be aware of. And during that time, she actually became unwell. She was in hospital. And she asked me to step in and help her out. It was the year after Princess Diana died. And I was uh, I was to take Nancy O'Dell, who had flown over to, the, to London, and go to Kensington Palace. And we were to do a piece of camera. Very simple, very easy. I had a good background in do this. It's not hard. I had my list of questions. There was nothing tricky there. So off I went with my cameraman, Soundy and Nancy. And we were in August in the sunshine outside Kensington Palace. And it was quite beautiful. I get a phone call at that time. And I'm telling you the story because it, it became so pivotal for me. Um, I, got, I got a phone call from back in America. And they said, drop the story now. Uh, Linda McCartney has died. You need to go. To, to Paul McCartney's place and uh, film a little piece with Nancy there. I'm like, right, okay. I don't know where Paul McCartney lives. So I say to my cameraman, can you tell me where Paul McCartney lives? And he's, he's, oh, he said, yeah, I think he's in, he's nice. He's in, he's somewhere down, down the way. Look, let's jump in the car, let's get going. So great, I kind of knows where we're going, hoping that he really did. It became quite evident he didn't know where we were going eventually. But we ended up in a um, 
in a little village and I could tell from the look of my cameraman's face that he was completely clueless as to where we had to be. So I dropped them off. I saw a, a building being being scaffolded by a whole bunch of guys. So I dropped the, uh, the team off at the pub and went and spoke to these men and said, can you help me please? I, I need to know where Paul McCartney lives. And they went, oh, no problem. He's, we don't know the actual house, but he's at the next village take that road, next village, Pease Marsh, off you go. So we did. And when I got there, I got to the uh, pub and thought, this will be the best port of call. I'm going to go into the pub. Walked in with my clipboard and um, went up to the pub at the and unexpected look at me and told me to get out of the place. There any reporters there that they uh, that somebody had died and they weren't interested in having us on the premises, which I of course never expected and thought, oh God, okay, what do I do now? So I said to him, look, okay, fair enough. Um, can you direct me to a place where I can get a lovely shot of the village? Somewhere high would be good. And he went, okay, go up the road there to the church at the top of the hill where I said thank you and off we went. We got up to the church at the top of the hill and there was uh, a sparky, uh, an electrician who was rewiring the church and Nancy, uh, <laughs> we decided okay this is as best we're going to get, uh, let's just do a piece uh, to camera announcing uh, Linda's passing. He, I grabbed the electrician and said, did you know Linda? And, you know, were you able to tell us anything about her and, and what she was to the village? And um, he did. And I don't think Nancy was terribly impressed with what that, that was sounding like as he was talking about jam and all sorts of things. So, um, you know, I could tell this is not really going to work. But we had a little piece in, in the can that was kind of okay. It, it certainly wasn't what they were expecting of me but that was probably the best I could do. As I was about to leave I turned to the electrician and I said I guess you wouldn't tell me where Paul lives would you? And he said no but if you drive down that road there and you see a couple of guys sitting on a on a gate that's it. Went, okay. And so we drove down uh, it was a, a gravel road and we drove down and um, sure enough, I thought, okay, um, let's drive past them and go down the road a little bit and see if we can see a house in the distance. Sure enough, there was quite distant, but a, a, a big home that was in the, set in the countryside. So I got Nancy and set her up, you know, beside some beautiful trees and clearly the home in the background. and. Said, let's do a piece here, that'll be fine. And um, she was able to refer to this being Paul McCartney's home. And the next, in the next minute, the guys who had been on the fence came running down and started tackling us and taking our cameras off us, and it got quite kind of heavy. And I said to them, please stop that. We're not actually breaking the law, we're on public ground here, and um, don't break our camera view, please. And they stopped and the man said, do you want, you know? And I went, well, ideally, I'd actually quite like Paul McCartney, but of course that's unreasonable on a day like today. But his publicist would be really great. If I could, if you're asking me what I really want, that's what I want. And so he got on the phone and he passed me his phone. Now I have the shouting publicist shouting at me and telling me how terrible we are. And he also said to me, what do you want? And I said, well, look, my job here is to get this, you know, to announce this sad day. Um, what I want is, of course, Paul, but if you're available, why don't you give the story to Nancy and really do it beautifully? And he went very quiet. And he said to me, okay, meet me at the pub. And I'm thinking, oh my God, I've got to go back to the pub. But we went back to the pub and we were allowed, and we 
we recorded a very beautiful, very heartfelt story from a very sad publicist who had been clearly close to Linda and Paul. And it was um, a, a beautiful piece, actually. And so on the way back in the car, I said to Nancy, uh, we've got a choice here to send them everything, satellite all the back and they'll cut together a piece. But you know what they'll do. Um, and there were some better moments in that entire talk. So if you're okay, can we do a soft edit of the camera here and just feed them back the really beautiful, heartfelt story that we shot and that affected us so much? And she agreed. She agreed. So respect. So we did that, and it was the first story to break in the world, and it went to Reuters, and it went everywhere. And it was great. I, I felt like I never wanted to do another one of these stories again after that day. It was far too stressful. But I did go on to continue doing this. And what I learned that day, seems that all my first day jobs are, are tough. I fully expect it now. But I learned a lot that day that, to be honest and truthful, and say exactly what you want and what you need and really respect everyone's needs. You know, I had to walk away from the pub. There was a big possibility I was going to have to walk away from the job entirely and say, this is not going to happen. I was quite willing to do that at the end of the day. And, and if anything you get from what I share with you today, it's those gems that take with you and hold them in the back of your mind draw them um, because they will really serve you in the long run with whatever you're doing be it interviewing somebody you know interviewing someone you don't know um, so that that was that story and and when I um, after six years of doing that quite a few times and I very much enjoyed it I learned an awful lot about filming and about getting a story in a very fast turnaround situation I would always be given the questions to ask. They generally <laughs> were, yeah, quite issue driven or whatever. They were driven in a way that I probably would never ask questions of people. So I did have my own way of working, but of course I always had to get the story. That was my brief. I always had to get their story. I'm sure they didn't like what I did every time, but they got, you know, I, I managed to do it for a few years. And it wasn't my day job. I really did that. But it took me all over uh, UK and Europe. And I got to work on some incredible um, sets and meet some wonderful, wonderful people. Um, absolutely superb actors. So it was a, a wonderful experience. In 2004, I was burnt out from advertising. And I never wanted to do another Hollywood story again came back to New Zealand and what happened was that um, I thought, right, I'm not going to go back into agency. What am I going to do? And my love had been filmmaking. So I approached TV New Zealand to see if they would let me do a documentary on Max Gimlet, who was a New Zealand um, artist having a huge retrospective at the time in New Zealand. Um, and he was in New York. I'll play you a little clip of, of this documentary. But I was very, very keen at that stage to really dive into portraits about people and, and find out their truth. So let me now take you to the next documentary and give you a little bit of a taster for what that was a couple of minutes long and it'll give you a taste for him and the style I took from for telling that particular story.
lot of painters on my street. Mark Rothko straight across the road, uh, Bryce Martin, Jake Berto, Roy Lichtenstein. The area was full of artists. This is my temple, a sacred space. Max was very knowledgeable and familiar with New York painting from seeing a lot of it in the museums and the whole tradition uh, coming out of abstract expressionism, which he and his contemporaries in New York followed and were working through. So he was part of a tradition of New York painting that uh, was very visible. I think it's useful to think of him in terms of his generation. Distraught over politics, distraught. He grew up in Puritan New Zealand. The art that precedes him has the marks of that repressiveness. But in some sense throwing that all over. One of the best reflecting devices is the skull that has endless patience, your death waits for you. We don't know when it is, so we need to be daily prepared. I need to recognize, as the Buddha taught me, my deathbed and go into my death posture and link up with my teachers. Full circle, deep fathom five, something comes around. Recognition. So, Max, that was my first documentary, not the easiest documentary to make. He uh, is a fantastic textural personality. I knew the early on it was not going to be that easy to be with him. He can, he's quite, uh, he's not a people pleaser unless you buy him paintings and things. And um, so I thought it was very wise for me to get the story to go and sit with him in his in his studio for a few days just prior to shooting. Again, with documentaries of about this duration, and it, it ends up being about 30 minutes long. It's quite fast turnaround. You shoot it in about five days. So I, I took a few days in advance, flew up to New York, and sat and said to him, Max, do you mind if I if I come into your studio prior to this and and sit there and go through your archive and decide what I what I can use out of your archive. He's an amazing archivist to actually um, figure out what I'm going to use in the documentary. If you're happy with that, set me up in a corner and uh, let's just be, let me be there and, and go through everything. He did. It. He didn't set me up. up in the middle of his space. And you remember at the very beginning he said, "This is my sacred space," and I thought, "This is." This is quite telling what he's doing here. He's putting me bang in the middle of his space. And and there was a table there and surrounded by boxes. So I would spend a few day, a few hours every day going through his archive work. And in that time, he walked around me, he circled me like a uh, like a wild animal circling the prey, really. It was very intimidating, it was very different. It really gave me an insight into his character. I knew uh, it was very primal, and I guess I knew that I was going to come. He was going to have moments while I was shooting where I was going to be thrown into quite tough situations, and it did. It happened, not that often. He was um, wonderful, actually, incredibly wonderful. But yeah, he would flare, and I had to be prepared for that. So I'm really glad I intuitively went and did that because I was then ready. I was ready for whatever he was going to throw at me. At one point, that didn't happen. So, um, yeah, that, that was an interesting journey. I also had to, I had a real sense in my mind how I was going to tell the story. 
clearly that was quite different to anything you've ever seen on Access Hollywood. I was really into Come and Let Me. I've got beautiful imagery here to work with. I've got a strong character to drive his story. And I've got to get that out of him. He's very willing to express himself, which is beautiful and a little unusual. And um, I wanted to pull the documentary together in a way that was truthful to him and his time. And that felt to me like if I made it more like beat poetry, which was which was what he he was into in, in the prime of his life moving into that studio. So I that's what I did. I, I made a creative decision around that. Not because it was what I liked, although I do like it. It was right for him and the story that and his own particular story. So that really set my bar, if you like, for how I needed to continue as a filmmaker. Now what happened was I made another documentary about opera and that process, that art process as well. But um, each one of these documentaries took about a year, you know, to organize, you know, produce and make. And um, I needed to actually have a day job. Very fortunate, and I was asked to come and write director's treatments for a, a production company here in New Zealand called The Sweet Shop. And I thought, why would I write another director's treatment? Now, I thought that every all directors and film people like myself would just make write their own treatment. And let me explain what a treatment is. When when you write a script, when you when an advertising agency writes a script or a script writer writes a script for a, for a film, exactly the same process. That script gets then farmed out, if you like, to a couple of directors who will direct that film, be it a commercial or be it a movie. And they read that script and they decide how they're going to approach it, what look they're going to give it, uh, how they're going to develop the characters, how they will cast it. And as you can imagine, if a script was written and it went out to someone like Steven Spielberg to have a look at, and Quentin Tarantino to have a look at, they'd have very different approaches to that one script. So this is the, the process that happens. And I, I was looking at scripts, advertising mostly, although I've worked film, film scripts as well, but most of my day job is mostly advertising. And um, I get to step in and be that director and write their visual creative treatment for them. So it was back in advertising, but it was from a whole different angle. And it was at a point where I could be ultimately creative um, with an idea. So that was exciting. I could work with the director. At the end of the day, the I is not me, it's them. I'm ghostwriting it for them. And why would they do this? There's a couple of reasons. Some people are not writers. Some people are just not, that's not their thing. Some people are uh, great on the, on the call to the agency, um, but, but can't get it down on paper. Some people are just time pressed. So my job is to jump into their shoes, become them like a frustrated actress almost, and be their voice. And when I am their voice, I, I need to write with their vernacular, write with their the beat. We all have a particular beat in our voice. And I've had to listen to that prior, prior to that with by having a telephone call with them or a recorded call. Sometimes I don't get that opportunity to actually have that closeness prior. And this week that came in, I never actually met the director. I never spoke to him over the phone. He was on a boat somewhere between Sweden and Italy in a storm. But I did get a clip of him talking to the agencies and I was able to look at his work. And from that, I was able to discern 
a style of how he would potentially speak and write. And that's my job. I jump in, I do that, I get about 48 hours, and I get 48 hours to produce something along the lines of this. This is for um, a, a director uh, called Patrick Felitti. Okay, so here's a treatment. And um, and this, as I said, gets produced in about 48 hours. I do the words, not the pictures. Somebody else is doing the pictures. This was a response to a Google uh, script that came in for Australia. They, it's a, it's a really beautiful story. They wanted, they know that that how we use Google, we tap into our phones and we go and we ask a question and it comes up with all sorts of you know answers and options. The story in the script was actually about a parent who. Um, who was a Sudanese refugee and his daughter was going to school, becoming an Australian kid, and she wanted to play football. And uh, he knew nothing about football, so he could, you know, ask Google. So th that was the story. And this is the treatment I wrote for Patrick um, and with Patrick to be able to come up to ideally win the job. And he did win the job, and I'll be able to show it to you in a minute. And so what we do is I write I write what where he is at with it. Patrick was a good option for them because he'd already made a documentary about Sudanese refugees. So he was very clear he wanted this to be on to honor the reality of of Sudanese people and that it not be a sanitized advertising vision of them at all. It needed to be heartfelt. It was a dad trying to help his daughter. And so you can see, even from the visual time that we were we were giving at that very early stage where it was just words on paper, this is where he wanted it to go. And so it's a big document. It's 41 pages. But you start to see what gets put together for them to even just win the job. And that's my role for them, to hopefully help them win the job and um, and he did and he did a beautiful job of it and I'm going to play that for you now Just protect your scooping your ice cream. Can I get the bundle tart another? Like yes, that's it. Love is everything because love makes the world go round. Love is the foundation of our soul. Your daughters have a blinder. What is a blinder? And the love for someone or something hey, mate. Hey, mate. Hey. is the greatest fit that ever existed. That was a blunder. Thanks, my God. That's what love is. So that was a, a story about fitting in. And um, it did really, really well. And, um, you know, it wasn't an easy journey for Patrick to take these. It's always quite hard to create um, the vision you absolutely want when you have a client and, and an agency involved. But it came out quite well. And... Um, what I would say about that, it was a heartfelt story. And when when stories are heartfelt, they really resonate, they do work. It was about love. Love is truth. It's exactly the same. So the more you can tap into your personal truth to 
when you're interviewing people or when you're writing a document, I would advise you to absolutely do this because it pops off the page. In this case, it won him the job. And then the job wins, you know, once he's actually created it, it then wins him more jobs. So that's, that's what I do sort of day to day. Um, but I also, after that, I was asked to step into the role of being a director, writer for a documentary thread called Attitude Live in New Zealand. Uh, it's been running here for over 10 years now. And it started off as a very small segment and it's grown to, to what it is now. It's the largest disability documentary thread in the world. And um, they called me up and said, would you come and make documentaries with us? Uh, it, you know, sometimes, not all the time. I didn't want to be absolutely employed to one company because I was doing my work with directors otherwise. It was going to be maybe a couple of documentaries a year, and I said, absolutely, I'll do this. And why it excited me was, again, it was making human portraits that were heartfelt. One of the uh, first documentaries I made, from, you know, I'll go back to my first, my mother was dying. My mother had uh, Alzheimer's, and... Um, I say she was dying at the very beginning of the documentary. She was quite good. We didn't know how long that would go. And I didn't know quite how this was going to unfold. But there was um, a situation that we really identified as, as a need here and probably everywhere. Was particularly if there was a, a, you know, a, a husband and wife situation, the male partners are often overlooked when it comes to dementia and, um, and Alzheimer's, and you have a split that happens in, in the family. They're living with their partner, usually in their latter part of their life, enjoying what they think is going to be their last, you know, 10 years or whatever. And then this happens, and they have to let go of that person, either into a facility, which is what happened with my father. Um, it is a documentary that you can watch. It's a good half hour, and it's called Together Alive, um, Together Apart. I'm sorry. And yeah, it was really the drive there was to show my father's journey, what happened, and what often happens is that um, it also became my mother's journey, and I, you know, to an extent, mine as well. So. I'll show you a little bit and I'll just show you some of the tough situations that as a storyteller and when you're just getting the story, you one has to step into. So I'll just give you a little clip here of mine. Take big steps. Yes. I'm sleeping in here. Here's your bedroom. There we go. I will just there we go. Better? How's that? Good. Is that my husband? It wasn't much use for the car. Oh, help! Fuck! I'm sorry. I can't. It's all right. Oh, God. No, oh yeah, no, no, I'm fine. I've just got to get past this. There are no rule books. And you've got to make your own pathway in your own way for each case. So I've learned a lot. I've. <clears throat> I've been there at my dad's death. I wasn't there for my mother's death, but soon afterwards, but nothing has been like this one.
so yeah you can see it can get quite tough when you're doing human portraits and I was stepping into disability and yes I made a very personal one to start with I strangely enough I didn't find that one so hard to do. I was obviously very close to everyone and I included my, it's the one time I did include myself because it was appropriate too. Normally I would never do that, but it was appropriate too. And members of my family as well. And I watched, you know, it was in the very beginning when my mother was um, first admitted into the care home. She was in quite good shape and she was quite calm. But the deterioration journey and what my father had to do back at home now learning to iron his own you know just just live alone live as the life of an elderly man living alone in his own space at his age so that that was that particular one and it went on I went on to make many others in the disability sector and I guess being in this I was always going to get quite tough situations and I'm going to play you another clip and the interesting thing about this clip was a little bit of my own um, I didn't quite get it right I I really didn't ask enough questions of Sophia at the beginning and I took this young woman who had fallen off her horse and become a tetraplegic overnight at the age of 19. I was on the first day of shooting, taking her back to uh, where this happened. She was completely okay. She knew this was what was going to happen and, and had been always fine to me on the phone when I discussed it with her. And there was no issue there, I thought. But I actually had never asked her the question, have you been back there before? I found, found that out interviewing her that morning, my first day of shooting, my first day of actually meeting her face to face, that we were going to go and see where the accident happened uh, for the first time. So let me play this for you again. It was a little bit long, but I'll come back to you afterwards and discuss how it, how it happened. I was the horse, and then he spooked at something. He bolted, and I couldn't hold him back. And that's when I fell off and broke my neck. The phone rang, and they did not try and sugarcoat it. They told us that she was a complete tetraplegic, which means that there's no messages coming down from the point of injury. Today we are going to the racing stables where I started and ended my career. I haven't actually been there since the accident. I've got a vague idea of where I had the fall. That's where it broke. Yeah, it that bit there. Oh, wow. So the horse broke that, or I broke that? You broke that. You right?
so sick, I love. I don't have anything against the horse. I just want him for So it was a tough first morning of shooting. And I, between her seeing the fence where her, her little body had broken that fence, and us going to then see the horse that was very much chopped in that sequence, um, I said to her, so I'm so sorry, um, do you want me to stop? This is, this is full on. And she went, no, classic Sophia, beautiful Sophia, style, she went, no, no, let's keep going. And the documentary does go on, I'd really, <laughs> I'd really uh, encourage you to watch that because it's incredibly upbeat and she's an incredibly upbeat girl. And it becomes a, a, a really wonderful story of fortitude, really, and, and positivity. Um, but it was a, I had that moment, do I keep rolling? Do I keep probing? What do I do here? And um, I stayed with it. And I would encourage, again, you know, when you're, I'm trying to make this relevant to whatever situation you're in, and interviewing people, for whatever reason, be it if you're developing something for them, to go deep, but um, be willing to pull back and hold space for them and be strong and to, you know, really be strong. Um, you have to draw on yourself. And it's not easy sometimes, to be really honest with you. I. Um, Sometimes I've been in situations where it's been intensely sad. There was a man who was a young, young man who was in his 30s. He had a beautiful family, Maori policeman, and he was dying of motor neuron. And he wasn't, didn't have long. And he wasn't accepting his, what this was going to happen. And it was so hard. And so what did I do? It, you know, shooting this, it was like, at one point I just said I need a break and kind of went to the bathroom and had a cry. Other times I will cry quite openly in front of people. And but but then there's a point too where you have to kind of pull the energy up again and bring them back. So I would I would say whatever spiritual practice you have, draw upon it, be it within just a fortitude within yourself or whatever. Use whatever you've got. But if you do um, have this opportunity to be in people's lives and interview them, go deep. You will get the goal, you'll get the truth of what's going on for them, particularly uh, if they're in compromised or fragile situations, which I think maybe part of the coursework that you will be doing is, is about fragility in society. And for you to be able to go deep, you have to give something of yourself as well it's really important that you um that you connect um the biggest thing i would say listen listen with your ears but listen with your heart listen to what's being said record it and then go back and listen again because you will hear so much more with directors um when they're taking their brief or their treatments, I get them to record the, the Zooms or calls if possible, because what happens is the, they will ask a question of the agency, have I got room to change the script? And quite often the, the agency will go, yes. And the way they say yes might mean no. And I can hear that. I hear that on behalf of them. At the time, the director generally will just hear yes and go, yay, I can do it. You know, I've got free reign here. And and that's and I understand that. They're on a roll. 
I'm there to kind of go, mm, it's not quite what, it's not quite the truth. And so listening is everything, but it's not just listening with your ears, it's listening with your heart, as I say, and empathy and going in deep with that person and sharing with them and allowing them to, to then give you something of themselves that may be really, really helpful. My process, I research, I then speak to them, perhaps go and see them if it's local and I can. Um, but we hit the ground running, really, um, shooting. I have all my questions sorted out. And then I get there on the day and I put my questions aside. I know them. Um, and I then kick off and we go into an interview situation. And what unfolds will not will be other threads that I haven't thought of. They will tell you stories. They will come up with stuff that you haven't considered. And at that point, you need to go off on that little tangent because there will be gems in there. And so you do that and you stay present. And then at the very end, I go back to my my questions and sort of say to them, give me a minute, please. Did I forget anything here? And um, and then we, and then I, you know, might do some cuts or some questions and have a little think and take a moment. Have I got the story here? Or do we need to do it? Do some more probing. And that can be coming at another time. It's exhausting for people. When they're living with disability, it's exhausting. And, and they, um, they might be the carer, they might be the parent of an autistic child. It's exhausting. So giving them the leeway to step away, to come back, is, is really important. One of the great projects I worked on was St. Lucy's, my, one of my favorite ever documentaries. And St. Lucy's, why it was a favorite, I had no expectation really when I walked in there. I knew it was a, a school for dis disabled children in Sydney. I knew they had a vast range of disabilities in there, which was a little unusual. Uh, specifically, for, it wasn't a mainstream school, it was specifically for disabled children. It had been started by the Dominican um, nuns back in the 1930s as a school for the blind. But of course, we have sorted blindness out in the world pretty much now, and there are very few fully blind schools there. So over the years, I think I think through the 70s, right through to the 80s and 90s, they got a range of, of other disabilities they were starting to accept. And now they have uh, quite a, a broad range. It was a very difficult documentary to make technically. The noise was unbelievable. The, and there is no wrangling these kids. You know, The pace that they work at is amazing. And um, But what I, what blew me away was the one-on-one -on -one, uh, appreciation of each child. Um, let me play for you a couple of clips from that, and we'll talk about that. And the, I'm going to play you the opening to the doco, which which gives you the opening for a day school. Every single day is like this for when at St. Lucy. <laughs> Love is the foundation for any good education. And it's really important for the child to sense that, to get that, to feel it. And then feeling secure from that platform, well, they'll be challenged, they'll have a go at anything and be able to be a bit courageous and step out of the comforts that are new. And that's how we learn. And so it's really important for children as they come into school that they actually feel loved, that they feel cared for, they feel nurtured, that they feel safe. Okay, I'm going to go straight to another clip because I think it's appropriate to give you just a sense of the uh, technical difficulty. I would say love is the basis for all your projects. If you love what you're doing, if you love what you're creating, 
then um, make that the basis for everything and be open to being very, very fluid because you are going to get thrown off track. About 70% of our children have autism. Many are non-verbal and have real challenges of how to engage with the curriculum. Everybody else, we are going to be cooking. Our whole focus really is very much the individual and what's going to benefit the child. All our teachers are experts in their field and we want the children to really find their, their language for learning. <laughs> Here at St Lucy's there's a focus on literacy and numeracy. One of the challenges of course is one child with autism is different to the next child with autism. And so a lot of the research indicates the visual way of helping children actually gain an understanding of their world. We find that the creative arts is the sort of gateway in. So my role at St Lucy's is the head of creative arts. So I came here for what was going to be one term as a drama specialist, and then they kept me. <laughs> one, two. We want the creative arts to be about two things. The time in the studio should be a time for expression and self-exploration, and it should complement the learning that they're doing in their classroom. So in drama, we want to build their articulation and their vocal projection and their capacity to work together. Visual art, we really want them to learn some good technical skills around drawing and form and composition and line. Up higher, so it doesn't splash. So you can see, you know, those assemblies happen every single morning. And luckily for us, it was really, really hard. They're hugely noisy. And I was looking at my cameraman who was right across the assembly hall and my sound was at the back. And I looked at them and just said, oh, what are we doing here? <laughs> and they just shut up. And I'm just, there is no rehearsals. They just shut up. And trusted and both of them technically really good but trusted it was going to be okay and it was and um, we then with that story we focused on a couple of different people with different um, disabilities one was highly functional one was highly um, you know uh, very sort of non-verbal to a degree to a degree she'd actually been non-verbal I'm going to show you that now we Jess to just give you a sense of how they have to how they have to actually tap into the person exactly what we're doing what you will be doing when you are interviewing and looking at people for, that you need to get information out of and finding a key that works for them we kind of always knew there was something special or non-typical about Jess she was five when she was diagnosed with autism spectrum disorder. Jess is a really clever girl. Just when she is anxious, will completely shut down. And so we went to a mainstream school, but doesn't cater for special needs. And um, we had a few difficulties there, didn't we? Yeah, unfortunately, we found out that. They refused to make any adjustments for her or for her condition. She was so anxious, she would sit there and rock and shake and cry. She didn't speak at the school. And once we realised that finding a school that is open-minded enough to actually accept her for who she is. Initially, we were really hesitant to put Jess into a school that only catered for children with special needs. We thought, will it label her? Is she going to pick up behaviours from other children? Will she go backwards? but from the minute we came in for orientation day, we knew that this was the place for her. Jess? Dad? Jess, would you like to come tell your news? Head up, though, like a big girl. Hello. And we say, hi, Jess. Hi, Jess. Hi, so tell me, what did you get? A new magazine. And what kind of magazine? Um, pink. My experience with Jess is she comes across as quite shy. And to use the skills that she does have, because she does have quite a lot. I have a question. Oh, yes, all this Jess. question. Jess. Jessica, look at me. Right. What you got? Hang Jessica, on. you need to look at me. I can't turn my yeah. Jessica, look at me, Saldus. 
Turn around like a big girl. That's it. Look at me. Yeah. Did the shop have just magazines or was it a toy shop? Toys and magazines. Toys and magazines. Can they come and sit down? Can they have a break? After drama. Coming to drama is actually not an easy thing for Jess because it's outside of her routine. So to do anything different can be a little bit daunting, can be scary, and that's okay and that's all natural, but we still want to include everybody. And I try and make a connection with everybody and it's just finding the key. And, and for today, it was about her being the princess. Sky, you go, woohoo! <laughs> After you see a place like St. Lucy's with the class numbers and the specialist care, She's doing things we never thought would be possible, certainly not within a year or two of starting school. The approach of the school has created a, you know, a, a jest that we didn't think was possible. So it was an amazing, it was an amazing school and there were so many stories like that. Um, it was hard to shoot because also every door locks down. Um, <laughs> those kids are all of various needs and they're all they were all able to scupper out the door and escape at any, any moment. But they, there was an incredible sense of happiness there and nurturing and love, just so much love. And out of that, they were able to teach kids to varying degrees. There's one young woman who ended up, you know, she was able to sing for many, many years. Um, another kid was, you know, he, he was able to, he was able to be safe in the community. So what happened to him, he uh, was able to read the timetables on the trains and, and they do a lot of social engagement of, of society, how you can make yourself aware at a shop and you could, you could see what they were heading towards there. And so this little boy actually at one point, um, got lost and he was able to find his way home and you know what at St Lucy's that's a total win that's educating someone that's giving them a skill in life that that is going to keep them safe and that might be um, as far as it goes in the traditional education system with, with that child I'm sure it will go much further but you know what that's okay they what they like detectives will be like detectives as well your goal and your, your drive to, be, to want to be a detective and really find out what's needed um, from you in, in the world. Uh, you're developers, from what I understand, of, of creative technology. And so finding out how to really apply that, your creativity, in a way that's meaningful for the people who you are making it for is really important. We come in with assumptions. I would say leave your assumptions at the door the minute you meet your people, be it on Zoom or wherever you are, drop them. Nothing will necessarily be as you think. I had a classic situation with a little autistic boy, not at St. Lucy's, it was a different documentary, where I wanted to shoot him at lunchtime in the school, racing around with the other kids. I thought he'd be racing around with the other kids. He really wanted I needed to put a, a sound device on him, mic him up, so that we could hear. He looked at me and said, no, I'm not having that on. And I went, why not? And he went, well, you can hear into my brain. And that little face in front of me was not going to hear anything different from him. That's what he believed. Uh, I then had to tell a white lie. Um, to, because we didn't want to be able to record and we didn't want to chase him with a, with a mic, you know, a boom mic. Um, so I said to him, ah, what about I put it on you, but I turn it off and then we won't be able to hear into your brain. And he went, okay. So of course I turned it on and it was behind what he didn't, didn't see. But those are the fears and phobias and issues that you're going to encounter with. Later on, we were doing another piece with him and he was an incredible pianist and he was able to, you know, he was playing the entertainer, he was nine years old. And um, of course, I, I want to shoot it from wide and then I want to shoot close up of his fingers and I want to get all the different shots. 
and and I haven't checked in with him with that and I've just said this is my process so I'm just putting it on him and um, and so he played and I said that was great right we're going to do it again and he went no we're not no I didn't get it wrong and I went no and I had to really think in the moment because because in his mind his mind spirals very 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 quickly quicker than anything I went no 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 we got it wrong. I have to shoot it again because my cameraman didn't have the camera going. And so, again, I lied to him. But it, it, it was a white lie, and he was able to, because he's at this point feeling that he'd actually got something wrong. It's a, that can be a highly activating situation for a child with autism. And... Um, he accepted that and went and did it one more time. I knew we were only going to get one crack at it one more time. That was it. It was never going to be any more. But, um, but we did get it. The interesting thing, the, the fascinating thing about that story is too that later on when we actually laid it down um, in sound, the two recordings were within a hundredth of a second of each other. It was almost impossible for a human to be able to play with that accuracy is very incredible. So these are some of the things that you may have, uh, you may encounter. I would also, we're just coming up for time here, I would also really advise you to, you may be on a Zoom, to look around, to take notice of everything else, the environment someone's in, to see so much about them. Even if they would be so kind as to to pick up their laptop and walk you around the room and show you stuff they love. It's so telling. And that can spark another conversation. It can take you to another place. It can give you so much more. So be inquisitive about them as people. Uh, be sensitive to, um, in, you know, people of different cultures. I wonder if I have time, Katina, to, I, I'll probably do it. I've got a little clip that I'm going to play. I didn't make this, but it's a really beautiful story that we've made. We're in lockdown here at the moment in New Zealand. Very unusual. We haven't really had lockdown before because we've been COVID-free, but we have it at the moment. We've got a handle on it. And so to keep everyone happy um, or sort of feeling okay, they created this very beautiful piece for Auckland only, it's where I live, the city here, and we're the only ones in lockdown at the moment, to just, you know, to make us stop and think from um, an Indigenous point of view. Māori is our, uh, our culture here. Um, we tend to pepper our land, you know, this morning I said to you, Morena, which is good morning in Māori. We pepper, we pepper our language with other, with Māori, not so much Pacifica, but, but Māori. And, um, and this piece was actually created for us in the vernacular is what I would say in the sense of the way the story is told to just bring some calm, calmness to us in Auckland and to really to let us stop and breathe. I think it's a very um, transparent snapshot of the kind of government that we have too, which we're very, very lucky to have. Stop. Listen, Papa Tuanuku, the Earth Mother, is breathing. Tamaki Makoto, Auckland, still. Our Maunga, our mountains, standing strong. Our Moana, our ocean now louder than ever. Our tui and our kereru now need not fight with the daily hum of our busy lifestyles. So, normally loud and joyful, now soft and distant, waiting for the right time to rise again. Our land renewing, replenishing ready for your return. And our kai, our food, preparing to nourish. 
Enjoy time with your whānau, your families, your loved ones, and soon we'll unite again. Noho tafiti tu kotahi. Sit at a distance, stand as one. We, our land, our waters, our people, we aren't going anywhere. Dream. And when the time is right, we welcome you. But for now, listen. Papa Tuanuku is breathing. And it's a very beautiful meditative message to stop, to listen, to understand it's not easy, but it's beautiful too. Find the beauty. Find the beauty in people's stories. Find the beauty sometimes even in their pain. And relax and and bring your creativity to it in a way that is going to be meaningful for them. So I think I think that's me. I think I've talked enough. <laughs> Have I, Katina? And please throw it open to any questions that anyone may have of me.